And now, weighing in out of the blue corner, Josh the Pong Thompson. 100% agree. And on the other mic, he weighs in from the red corner, Big John McCarthy. Well, it is my distinct pleasure to be able to bring to you a guy that has done it all. A man that started out in Birmingham, England. I don't know how he, I'm sorry, it was Manchester. It was Manchester. Brings himself to the States, is on the Ultimate Fighter, wins the Ultimate Fighter against Josh Haynes, has an amazing career, and then tops it off by beating Luke Rockle, becoming the middleweight champion in the UFC. He defends his title. He ends up now being an incredible commentator for the UFC. How the hell did you get so lucky, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. You know, for anyone watching from England, I gotta say, I'm from Clitheroe. A lot of people from Manchester like to give me a hard time about that. They say he's yeah. not from Manchester, uh, and they're right. I'm from Clitheroe. Clitheroe. It's, about, it's about half an hour away from Manchester. But when I okay. came to the States, no enough. one's heard of Clitheroe. You know no. what I mean? No. So anyway, <laughs> no. um, it's a pleasure to be here, boys. Thank you very much. You just got back, right, from uh, overseas? You were in Paris, correct? Yeah, I was just out there in Paris. Yeah, I mean, John and I were working on a project together recently and we were talking uh -huh. about it. The travel, you know, it's it's a lot of travel, but I am very blessed, you know what I mean? It's like, yep. you, you, Josh, you know, yep. uh, John, you know as well, you know, the fight of, sorry, the life of a retired fighter, it can go many different ways. And a lot yeah. of the time it doesn't go a good way. It's a tough path, you know? So oh. I'm really lucky, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm living the dream in terms of a retired fighter. And yeah, there's a lot of traveling involved and going to airports and stuff like that, but no complaints here. I'm a very, very happy man. There's a lot of, there's a lot of energy that goes into what comes after fighting, you know, and, um, you know, those fighters that hold on to it a little bit too long because I think they're afraid to see what's mm. next. They don't know how to handle what, what potentially could be next. Um, you know, you've been blessed enough. I myself was blessed enough to jump right into being an analyst and being a commentary and doing. And I feel like you out of a lot of the ones that work for the UFC and also two just across the board. We've had a lot of ones that came on at Bellator when I was with them. They don't put as much work into it, which surprises me that like they don't do the research. They don't do they don't get to know the fighters. It's almost that, hey, I'm here and you're still here. I'm a I was a former champion. You're here. You're trying to get there. Do you do you sometimes see that, you know, um, or do you do you feel like, look, I need to put as much energy into this as possible? Yeah, I mean, look, listen, we're all just trying to get through our lives, you know, and, and yeah, I had a great <laughs> yeah, career. Yeah. In the UFC, I had a great career, but my life's not over. So therefore, the no. effort doesn't stop. You know, I've still got a responsibility to my wife and to my children. I'm very lucky. I had a good career and I made some good money. Uh, so, 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 you know, financially we're good, but like, I don't want to sit around for the rest of my life. I want to yeah. still be productive. I still want to earn as much money and give the best life and the best retirement. It's crazy. Now I'm getting close to thinking about my retirement. That's how old I am these days. <laughs> but it, it, it never ends. I mean, life's life's hard. Life's tough, you know. And if you're going to do the best job and put your best foot forward, you've always got to do work hard, whether yeah. that's getting ready for a fight uh, as a fighter or even now as a commentator. You know, I spend all week sitting there watching fights, looking at interviews, going to their Instagram and all that type of thing because I want to be prepared. You know, somebody asked me the other day, uh, I was on my YouTube channel and people said, uh, do you get live, uh, sorry, nervous when you're commentating? I'm like, well, I don't get nervous if I've done the research. If I yeah. know the people, if I know their fight history, if I know their background, there's no need to get nervous because I'm talking about something that I love and I'm passionate about. If, and it's on a very, very rare occasion, I've, I've scrimped on one guy a little bit. I'm like, oh, God, you're, you're scratching your head. Yeah. That doesn't happen these days because I learned my lesson. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like anything, man. You've got to work hard. If you want to be a success, you've got to work your ass off. Simple as that. I, t I was on Joe back in – on Rogan's show back in 2020, and it was just that understanding of, like <clears> – <throat> Fighters, I think, think like, oh, I just you just said it yourself, and it's easy for us to say it. Is oh, you know what we made pretty good money when we were fighting, and you know, and I'm good right now financially. The thing is, though, is that we've seen guys in the NFL who've made quadruple mm. the amount of money we've made, and they've blown yeah. through it. You know, I don't know if sure. you've seen that thing. Uh, Fifty, it's like a thirty for thirty. Yep. It's called broke. Thirty for thirty, broke. Yeah, it it's lets horrible. you know. It lets you horrible. know these guys have burned through. Mike Tyson, three hundred million dollars gone. Yep. You know what I mean, like. When people, when fighters say, "Oh, I'm good financially," you've got to still be thinking about what's next. What can I do to have a steady income? That's one. What can I do to give insurance to my family? Because that's huge if you have kids. 
Mm-hmm. And there's so much more after fighting. I retired at 40 years old. If I live to be 80, I have a whole other life, a whole other life to have to fund, yeah. you know? And wh- what did you do with your money? And do you think that's enough money to get you through? So yeah. I love your mentality of like, hey, I've got responsibility to my wife, my kids, my family, like everything to take care of them oh, until the also end. Also to myself as well, because, you know, I'm an ambitious guy and there's still a lot of things I want to achieve. Like people ask me a lot, would I go into coaching? And I absolutely want to do that. I miss being around the gym as much as I yeah. used to be. And I miss the just the feel of it and the smell of it and all that type of stuff. And I love seeing guys progress and get better and improve. And I want to, I do want to do that one day. But right now I'm still doing me. You know, I'm still yeah. trying to make a go of it. You know, I, I'm still, you know, I got into involved in mixed martial arts when I didn't even know what UFC was and it's served me so well. And there's still, there's still juice in that, uh, still, still a little bit of juice I can squeeze out of it. So I'm still trying yeah. to do the best. Just like when I was fighting, I was never the most t- talented. I wasn't the fastest. I wasn't the strongest or anything like that, but I worked my ass off and that's generally just, what I do through life, you know, yeah, I, I will work. I will, I, I'll work my ass off. That's for sure. I, like I, I got starting off when you first were on the ultimate fighter, you know, it was, it was evident by everyone that was around you. And just by me walking in there and seeing you, you were a worker. You wanted to learn. You were talking about, show me this, show me that. And you wanted to learn different things and everything was about, Hey, I'm going to be the, I'm going to, I want to be here. You won that. But the one thing that I, I could not believe out of it, and it, it could be just the way I looked at it, you got the rap of being a bad guy from that show. People, and no, you know, it's one of those things. I was talking to Josh Koscheck because he got the same thing. And you got this rap where people did not like you. It was like, oh, he's an asshole and stuff. And it's like, I would tell people, and I'm, I'm not, I would tell, dude, he's a great guy. He's an absolute great guy, man. I'm telling you right now that, oh, he's a fucking asshole and stuff. <laughs> What was it? <laughs> How did you feel? Because, I mean, I, I remember you. I would be there working a show, and you would walk in for the, you know, as one of the fighters not not fighting just to watch the show. And people would boo you, and I'd be like, what is wrong with people, man? But yeah. it, it, it had to get to you a little bit, but it changed. And that's what I'm asking is you became someone that everyone loved in the end. What was it like, and how did that change occur? You know, to be honest, uh, I kind of was an asshole back in the day. You know, I mean, I, I'm still the same person today that I've ever been, but I've just mm-hmm. learned to control my emotions better. I was very slow to mature as a child and I guess slow to mature as a man. But also, you know, the people that you surround yourself with play a big uh, factor in it. And I also knew that I was kind of being marketed as the British bad guy. You know what I mean? So I was like, all right, well, I'll have some fun with it. I'll play up to it. And I've always been, you know, a little mouthy. I've always been cocky. I've never been, you know, backwards in coming forward. So I'm like, all right, well, if that's the bo- uh, the role I'm going to play, fuck it. Let's play. Let's have some fun with it. So, and then, and then obviously I did have some bad influences around me at the time. I was with the team of people that weren't necessarily the best for me. And, you know, they brought out a certain side of me. Um, but 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 I moved out to America, um, just kept plodding along. And then I think eventually people saw the real me, you know, because, yeah, look, listen, when you're going to fight somebody, you talk shit. There's no problem talking shit. You're gonna oh, you were good at that. Fight. Yeah, yeah. And it's fun. We're going to fight in an octagon. We're going to fight in a cage. So I'm going to talk mad shit, okay? <laughs> After I, I've got no problem with anybody that I fought. You know, it's, it's funny. I was talking about this earlier. People always say, oh, I'm sorry to say this, Mike, but George St. Pierre is one of my favorites. I'm like, George St. Pierre is one of the best human beings walking planet Earth. Yeah, and just because I was an asshole with him leading up to a fight <laughs> doesn't mean I don't like the guy. He is an amazing example of how a human being should live their lives and, and conduct themselves. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, look, listen, I was a dick. I played up to it. I did. You know what I mean? And it served me bloody well. <laughs> yes, it did. On that old but, fight. But, but hold on. But it, it's tur- it turned. It turned somewhere. And I don't know if it was when you became champion with the way that that whole thing came about and you being a last minute replacement and everything, but it did turn to where all of a sudden people loved you and you yeah. had to feel the difference. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember, uh, it was the first UFC event that was on Fox. It was one, yeah. The Honda center in Anaheim. And I remember walking in there and literally, literally the entire building booed me out. It was, like, Ooh, it was 20,000 people, right? And I stood there and I just went like that to yeah. everyone. 
And that's the one, of, that's the show I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah, and then everyone like kind of started laughing. And some guy came over to me, and I like basketball now, but I just moved to America. Uh, and all I'd ever heard of was uh, the Lakers. Uh, uh, but some guy comes over and says, oh, I'm, I'm a guy that uh, does one of the big wigs at the Clippers. You know, anytime you want to come over for tickets, et cetera, take my card. The way you handled that was amazing. And I, I didn't even keep his card. And now I'm like, shit, the Clippers is a big team. I'd love to go watch him. <laughs> You know, I'm not the Clippers. What the fuck is the yeah. Clippers? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but but yeah, he probably thought I, it was a hair I, salon. He's like, yeah, 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 my haircut. Yeah. Clippers. Uh, yeah, no, I'm good, thanks. Um, but that, I mean, that's just I, I've always been myself. I've always been myself, and I think eventually people just kind of saw. Hold on a minute. He's not a bad guy, actually. He's uh, he's actually pretty funny, or or he's got a good heart, shall we say? But who? I I hate answering shit like this. Do you know what I mean? But it's the it, truth. Now you start to sound like an asshole. No, <laughs> no. What Not I guess all. I'm going to go back to the Ultimate Fighter because John brought it up. But was you got the bad rap, and I'm going to be honest, I had a little bit of that bad rap feeling for you as well. When the whole Matt Hamill, I think Tito was working with you and Matt Hamill in the in the cage, and there was like some something going on. Like he was trying to go hard, and you were like, "Hey, we're just drilling." I, I remember that vaguely, but I remember no. That's Matt was of, Tito's favorite. That's what yeah, it was. Yeah, I understand yeah, that without question. Yeah. Tito said. Uh, he's going to be my champion, and every champion needs a good training partner, right? So in my mind, I've flown all the way over to Las Vegas. It's my first time here. I'm obsessed with becoming a UFC champion. I've come on the Ultimate Fighter. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited for it, and I've just been labeled the champion's training partner. And in my mind, I'm like, no, 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 no. This no, is not, not what I'm here for. And Matt Hamill, as it turns out, he's a great guy, and he's a hell of a fire. He was so strong and I'm English, so I couldn't wrestle to save my life. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And he's throwing me around like a rag doll in the training room. So obviously I saw him as my biggest competition. So because you're young and because you're looking at him as a rival and as someone that's going to take away your dream, there was a little bit of animosity that built up in me. And I think he kind of felt the same way as well. And then sometimes when we were training and Tito would say time and everyone would stop and we'd be sparring and I'd stop and then he'd carry on punching me in the face. Mm. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm deaf. I'm like, yeah, I know you're deaf. But, you know, when everyone in the room has stopped sparring, you think you yeah. would pick up on that. Anyway, yeah. it was a very long time ago. So it did get a little bit heated. But looking back, it was just competitive rivalry. That's all it was. I wanted to win it. He wanted to win it. And for that reason, it, it just elevates you and makes you better. Do you guys, this, this is a side of, of you we've never seen, man. Very, very... Uh... I'm 45, Great. man. I, 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 <laughs> I get it. it. All the time. I say it all the time. Like the, the version of me that when I was fighting doesn't really exist anymore. Don't yeah. get me wrong. It's there. Somebody pokes the bear hard enough, then they'll find out. But I'm, I'm much, much calmer these days. You know, it, and it was a slow transition. Like I used to fight for the UFC, you know, so you can get away with certain attitudes, you know, yeah. and then I went into the commentary side and you could say that you're in the corporate side and you can't act it's the same lot. way no. as you can when you're fighting. So oh, no. it, you know, it no, was a little you progression, shall we say there, you know, um, and I've just grown up, you know, like I, I talked about this recently as well. Like Just in France, somebody stole my wife's I was gonna, I was going to just ask, I said, because hold on, you had a guy in New Orleans that punched you. Punch me in the face. Right? When you're taking pictures of something. You had yep. someone in your hometown attack yep. you when you're out to dinner. Yep. And then someone goes and steals your wife's purse in Paris. Mike, what is it? What is it? What is it? What is well, what's going on? Looks. People are jealous target. of good looking people. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. So I was in New Orleans, this guy was just taking pictures and he was being he was like, You can't take pictures. It's a long story, but just to be real brief about it. And I'm like, I, it's a public place. I'm taking a picture, okay? And he sees it. Put the phone away. So I said, suck my fucking dick. <laughs> and to be fair, he went, boom, and he punched me in the face. But it was literally, and I'm not saying this to sound tough, it was the weakest punch I've ever felt in my life. And my knee-jerk reaction, I laughed so hard. I literally laughed my ass off. Now, I'm with my wife, and I'm with my children, and there was a big gang of them as well. And let's be honest, you know they had a weapon or whatever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Someone had a knife or there was guns. Uh, and it didn't. It was It was literally that. It was so pathetic. And I I laughed. I laughed. I'm like, fuck, oh, you God. know, you're so, supposed to be a tough guy. Yo, yeah. buddy, you got to work on your punch power. And then I walked <laughs> off. Back home, this old dickhead from years ago sucker punched me. And I was there with my mom and my wife and and, and like old children. It was a big family get together. This guy was came in. All right, the guy came in the restaurant. 
and he's hammered drunk. He's about 60 years old. And I've got a scar between my eyes. And he came over and he says, you remember me? And because I've done well in the UFC, a lot of people know me, but I don't necessarily yeah. know them. Yeah, so absolutely. I pretended. I'm like, oh, hey, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. He goes, you don't remember, do you? I'm like, oh, I remember you. I remember your face. I just, I just can't think of your name right now. He goes, that scar between your eyes. I did that. And that happened in a bar fight where I got jumped and I had someone picked up a stool and smacked me in the face when I was about 17. So wow. almost 30 years ago in the mid 90s. right? And I've got no idea who it was. And he says, that scar between your eyes. I did that. And, and then I said, I said, right, I think you need to walk away. And he goes off to the other side of the restaurant and he sits there and he's just glaring at me with his two buddies and they're talking shit and they're really drunk. It's like six o'clock in the afternoon. I'm with my mum. She's like almost 80. She can't walk. We've got newborn babies. There's like 25 of us. It's a very, very nice night. It's a beautiful sunny day. We're having a nice, sophisticated, cheerful meal and a family reunion, you know? And these guys are being dickheads. So I, so eventually I get the manager. I say, right, yo, get rid of these guys, would you? And they went, yeah, no problem. So they get rid of them. At the end of the night, obviously, I've got to pay the bill. So I'm, I'm at the front, <laughs> I'm paying the bill, and they walk past the front of the restaurant, right? Because I'm paying the bill on the sly. I'm not trying to make a big deal out of it. So I disappear to the front as I'm paying the check, and then they walk past again, and they start talking shit. And because I'm not in the restaurant now, and like everyone can't hear me, I'm, I, I'm a bit more aggressive. I'm like, listen, you fucking asshole, what's your fucking problem? I'm sitting there with my mother, all right, I have a bit of respect. And as I'm talking to one of them, another one at the side, boom, sucker punches me. And he sucker punches me, and he falls on the floor as he hits me, <laughs> right? And again, it didn't hurt. He fell on the floor. A policewoman ran out of a store across the street, said, I saw everything. I'll press charges. I'll press, uh, Michael, please press charges. They're always causing bother around here. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. And I was annoyed with myself afterwards because I thought I should have at least just given him a leg kick. You know, yeah. just give him a leg <laughs> kick. But in my mind, when I was a kid, I was, all, I was well known in that town. And I was a little asshole. I was a tear away. I was always getting in fights. I was always getting arrested. Just bar fights, stuff like that. And I've grown. I'm not that person anymore. And I didn't want to come home to that small town. And the first couple of days I'm there, getting into a fight again, it'll be the talk of the town. They'll be like, oh, you know what? He hasn't changed. He was only home two days. He was getting into a fight in the town centre. You know what I'm saying? I was like, yeah. for, 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 for my reputation and growth as a man, I'm going to let you walk away right now. But just know you're fucking this close to me murdering you. <laughs> I swear to God, what happened in Paris? And this is part of the, you have two knee replacements, right? Yes. How two are you running after someone down the streets of Paris? I, I had to use a line bike. Ask, ask Josh. <laughs> I, I had to get a disc replacement six weeks ago. I'll see my doctor again tomorrow. Um, yeah, two knee replacements. We're in Paris. I stuck around for a week after with my wife, after Moicano had that amazing performance. Amazing. Um, and we're having coffee. Especially, especially with a collarbone that was already separated before he started. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, it just, just really is. I mean, incredible stuff. So we're sitting at a coffee shop, just having a quiet coffee, just having a sit down. And my coffee came and it was piping hot. And I like it a little cooler. So I go into the cafe to get some ice. When I come back, my wife's sitting there and she's got her purse over the back of the chair. And she says, I think that guy's just taking my bag. I'm like, what? She goes, I think that guy's just taking my bag. So I start running and she goes, I think it was him because she knows I'm going to go in hard because <laughs> uh, there's a lot of people around. And the guy looks at me and he starts running. But I, I run almost every day. So, you know, I, I caught him, no problem. Grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and he had the bag tied up in a towel. Uh, so like when he picked it, cover it in a towel so he hasn't got the bag. So he's actually pretty smart. If you want to go mm -hmm. out there uh, stealing handbags and purses, that's a pretty good idea. Anyway, I grab him and he just goes, oh, please, 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 mercy, mm -hmm. mercy, mercy. Uh, and drops the bag immediately. We're in a touristy area. There's families everywhere. There's kids everywhere. I'm not going to subject them all to violence. I'm not trying to prove to myself that. You're I'm such, you, you are yeah. such so, a pacifist now. I love so that. I I'm taking the PC I, I let go of him. Uh, no, I let go of him, but as he was oh, walking man. away, I gave him the biggest kick up the ass. <laughs> just, just a disrespectful. So, so hold off. it. It did make you feel a little bit better doing it, didn't it? Oh, of course it did. Of course. Of thought, course. You got to teach him a little bit of a lesson. And I know he was limping. There's got to the be some kind of consequence. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But yeah. yeah. But anyone out there, don't get the wrong idea, boys. 
Do not get the wrong fucking idea. <laughs> I've been I've been wanting to ask you about it. I, I'm good friends with Hendo. Been friends with Hendo for a long time. I, he yeah. was telling me I thought it was the first fight. This has nothing to do with the fight, but it has to do with in the back. And you were talking about the coaches and the trainers, training partners you guys had. He was saying, and I thought it was the first fight that your guys' corner before the fight, you guys were banging on the walls, yelling shit, throwing through it, like basically through the walls and this and that. What is that something you guys do? Is that is that is that a U is it a UK thing? Is it what is it? Well, Josh, if you're into sports and you are a guy that likes MMA, football, baseball, basketball. You're probably a guy that likes to bet on those sports, and BetUS is the way to do it. Right now, if you go to BetUS and use our code YouTube150, you will get an incredible 150% above what you put down, and the second time, if you put more money, 125%. BetUS is the way to go. We do give our odds. Sometimes they're great. Sometimes they're not. I'll be honest. (laughs) But we do give our odds for BetUS. And they are absolutely a fantastic betting site. John, that's why they call it betting, buddy. We're, we're betting on ourselves to win. That's what Sometimes. I'm betting on myself to do. So, Ooh. look, we, we really enjoyed using their odds over there. And they've actually come out with some early odds that, they, that we had talked about for the, um, for the newest pay-per-view that is coming up. And that's going to be a fantastic one. So make sure you guys tune in, head over to BetUS, use the use YouTube 150, get 150% bonus on your first deposit. On your next two deposits, you get 125% bonus. So guys, look up, head up, head over to BetUS and use our promo code YouTube 150. I I I have no idea. No idea. No, I swear to God. Okay, okay. I just wanted to know. And and, and you know how it is. Like, and John is like, there's a lot back in those days, each changing room's got like 10 fighters in there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's 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 pretty, you know, how does he know it was us? I mean, Uh, it was it was some (laughs) yeah, it was back going, cool blimey, governor. (laughs) (laughs) But uh yeah, no, 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 that wasn't us. Oh I also wanted to kind of move ahead a little bit to uh to my boy Luke Rockhold. Um, sure. You know, the first fight uh, ending the way it did and then him getting the win, coming back in the second fight, getting on taking it on short notice, winning the title. But I want to not I want to talk about that fight, those fights. Exactly. I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about you guys both were training kind of at the Ruka Center there, which is now like Tenori, which is the new clothing line here, but is yeah. with Pat Tenori and those guys. But you guys cross paths and stuff. And I felt like you guys kind of developed a friendship. Because there was a lot of the, it seemed like real banter, but then you guys kind of still train at the same facility. How did that all? How did that all pan out? What was what was it like actually when you guys yeah, finally? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I mean, the, it's not a surprise really because the reason why this beef, if you will, and I've got nothing against Luke. Again, it's just yeah. competitive rivalness. You know, I don't really know the man. You know what I'm saying? So how could I have any kind of real basis to dislike him or hate him? It's nothing like that at all. Perillo arranged some sparring with me. I was getting ready for a fight against Rockhold. And, uh, you know, we, we had a sparring match and maybe I got the better of him that day. And I'm a loud mouth prick. So in an interview, I mentioned it and Luke got offended by that. So he did an interview and talked shit about me and I talked shit back. And the next thing we're in Australia, you know, and he beats me fair and square. Um Obviously, we have the rematch. That one goes my way. Then after that, he starts. He links up with Perillo. He's training uh, down at the gym all the time. By this point, I've retired, so I'm not in there very often. Uh, but when I do go in, um, he'd be there on occasion, and it was all right. You know, we, we had a couple of little roles here and there, and nothing. You know, I wish him the best of luck. You know what I mean? As I said, I don't really know the guy. I don't. I've never hung out with him. I've seen him in the gym a few times, and that's about it. You know, bit of a weird. You guys guy. did a you guys did a little it's video. A weird back. guy. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. He's a fucking <laughs> weird guy. But, he, but God bless him. Because <laughs> I know I felt like I felt like Ruka and, and those guys were kind of like trying to like get a little bit of back and forth video on video. I thought it was great. You guys were. He was kind of giving you the evil eyes from across the gym as you were hitting the bag, and you were you know talking a little trash over to the side. But they did a couple yeah, no, videos for the, social. The, 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 yeah, the clip that you're talking about, I was completely oblivious that he was yeah. looking at me. You know, but then we had a little roll, you know, just for a bit of fun for a minute or two. Nah, he's all right. He's all right. As I say, he still he still leaves like the occasional weird message on Instagram. Like, yeah. the, like a couple of weeks ago, he just put, you okay, Mike? I'm like, what? Yeah, I'm great. Are you okay? That's the yeah. question. Stop getting knocked out. 
<laughs> he's, he's, you know, I've known Luke for a long time since the first day he walked into AK, man. And he's just, he just was like a young kid, just coming up surfing. You know, his brother was a professional surfer. He's good, overall a good kid, man. Super athletic, just kind of gifted as an athlete. Um, you know, whether it's skateboarding, whether it's surfing, you know, I mean, shit, he could play, man, whatever it was. Yeah. It, but yeah. No, no, no. He, he was incredible. He, he really was. And it's, it's a shame to be honest. And, and this likes, sounds like I'm bigging him up because it bigs me up in return. But Luke was just phenomenal. I mean, talk about athletically gifted yeah. and the way that he ran through the middleweight division, the way that he beat Chris Wyman, Loyoto Mashida before it. And then, yeah, listen, I, I landed a good punch. You know, that, that that's the game. It's the way it goes. And then after that, you know, he gets clipped by a Romero. And then I forget. And then it was Jan Blahovic. And then people yeah. just like completely forgot and started talking shit. And it's like, are you guys for real? Do you see what this guy was capable of? And everyone has their yeah. time. And maybe because he got knocked out three times in a row, it kind of took its toll a little bit. I think in the Paolo Costa fight, he showed tremendous heart. I know he just knocked out Joe Schilling in karate combat. He's a he's a very, very capable man and an incredible martial artist. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to have shared some time in the Octagon with him. Even let though me, he's a good guy. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's an overall good kid, though. I'm, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a story here, but I'm gonna, I need one, one bit of information. Let's go. How much? How much? When you, when you got that fight, and you said yes, I'll take it. How much planning did you and Jason do? Because Jason did tell me before the fight. I don't know if you recall when I went, I went in the back, talked to you, and I had people around me. Because those people were part, they were they were a guest of the California State Athletic Commission. They wanted to hear the rules done for the championship fight, and so they, you know, they're listening to me talk, and you're and you're sitting there being your normal self. You were you were actually super calm. You were having fun. You were you were laughing. You were you were in a really good mood. And then we went and talked to Luke, and Luke was just horrible as far as he was like, uh, John, this is an easy fight. This is. And when these people left, the thing they said is, I, I, I've never seen anyone like that in a, in a fight. Is that, is that the way everyone is? I go, no. I go, he is not taking his opponent serious enough because he's beaten him once. I said, and he's making a huge mistake. Mm. And, and you went out. But Jason told me, John, watch the left hand. Watch his left hand. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna hit him with the left hand. He's going to hurt him with the left hand. Did you guys have that all planned out? Is that what you were really looking for is to land that left hand over and over? Yeah, for sure. Jason identified the left hand um, and the left hook. We were certainly looking for it. Even, he even saw some like uh, training footage that he had on Instagram, Luke. And again, he said, look there, again, I, I remember this. Him saying, look, the hand's low. Every time he brings it back, his, left, his lead hand is low. So the left hook or the right hand is low, whichever one. So the left hook is open. Um, but, you, you know, I, I understand why he was taking me lightly because in the first fight, I mean, I'm blind in this eye. I can take the eyepiece out right now. Everyone's seen it a million times. No point cringing yeah. people out. Uh, so I was. Got, I went into that fight with one eye, and I had a big cut. Uh, the day before I left Australia, I got kneed in the face, and a big cut opened in my good eye. And in that first fight, about a minute into it, there was a clash of heads. Call it a headbutt. Call it a clash of heads, whatever you want. Blood's pouring into my eye. So for him... Some moments there, I'm blind in the octagon. Blood's pouring into my eye, and all I can see is red. So I wipe it out, and I can see for a bit, and then more blood comes in, and I wipe it out, and then I can see again. It was just a, that was the pattern, you know what I mean? And in between me bloody wiping blood, he kicked me in the head, and fair play. And then after that fight, it, the hardest part for me was that I just had to fucking swallow it because I couldn't say anything. Because if I said anything, yeah. which was a valid, not an excuse, a valid reason for why I was fighting so terribly and why I looked so off is because I was fucking blind for half of the fight, literally. Um, I, I, that'd be the end of my career. So I just had to swallow it and just have the world think that I was a shit fighter. And then coming into the rematch, I'm like, well, I, I've got one eye this time, you know? And that's why I was like, bro, if you think it's going to be the same fight, you're out of your mind. You, you, the circumstances were definitely in your favor the first time. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure people have heard this story a million times, so I won't bang on about it too long. No. So, hey, we're, we're one apiece. Fair play. The difference, though, like between this fight and then also the Hendo fight, was there much more – the two of them can combined. Was there a lot more gratification on either, between the two? Was one more than the other? Was the Hendo win more gratifying to you, or was the Luke one more gratifying? I mean, they both had big consequences because beating Luke, 
more importantly was I became the champion and realized a lifelong dream, which is what every guy that has his eyes on the UFC wants to achieve, guy or girl. So that was amazing. That was, you know, I mean, it was validation to myself on so many levels. Like after that fight, I jump on top of the cage and I turn around and I say, fuck you. And I was pointing at Luke when I said it, but it, ultimately I was speaking to the world. I was speaking to every single fucking journalist that doubted me, every fan, every person on Twitter, because believe me, I saw it all. I used to see the comments. He sucks. He's got pill office. He's this, he's that. He shouldn't be there. He's just been gifted an easy road and an easy path and all the rest of it. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? This is what I do. I fight. You go and ask anyone from where I'm from, they will tell you. I don't fuck about, even though I do get sucker punched every other week these days. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I, you, you know, so like I was so frustrated, but that fueled me and it motivated me. So that's why winning the belt was great. That's why I said, fuck you. That was like kind of to everyone that doubted me along the way. Uh, and then the, the, the one against Henderson, that was defending the belt and bringing it back to England which is something I was so proud of to be the first guy from the UK to become a champion and then to defend it on UK soil. And yeah, with it being Dan Henderson in a rematch, I, I didn't really care about who the opponent was. For me, it was more important about bringing the belt back to the UK. I beat Luke. I went out on quite a hefty celebration session. Monday morning, I'm still hung over. Dana White calls me and offers me Dan Henderson because he'd just beaten Hector Lombard on the same night. Yeah, And obviously because of the storyline between the two of us and UFC 100, you know, uh, all the stars kind of aligned. A lot of people like to talk shit and go, oh, Bisping picked Henderson. I'm like, no, I was still hung over. And Dana said, what about Dan Henderson? I was like, yeah, sure. I kind of owe him one. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. But the, the way he beat Lombard and the way that you came back and, or not came back, but the way that you were able to take no, that fight yeah. on short notice and fucking beat Luke. It just made sense. I mean, it, yeah, let's yeah. captivate. Let's let's capture this moment, man, with the guy who is exactly. Exactly, it did. It, it made, made all the sense. sense in the world with, with him getting that spectacular knockout, and it was a spectacular knockout. And that's what Dan's capable of. You know, he's, yeah. his his power is ridiculous. You know, as I felt in that second fight as well. I mean, he clear, the whole game plan is you know avoid that right hand. But as my old <laughs> boxing coach used to say, you don't get, get you don't go in the rain without getting wet. You know, yeah. he built a career on that. <laughs> crack me in the first round, crack me in the second. And I tell you, fuck, my God. Yeah, he bossed my face up with, with two punches. He he made a He's, mess of me. I've, have you ever, you, I know you've shaken his hand, but I mean, it feels just like you're grabbing fucking leather, just like leather stone. Yeah. It's just, it's just like a hard oak tree. Yeah. 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 It feels like an no, oak tree. It's crazy yeah. because, again, <clears throat> having one eye, he hit me here and it fractured all my, it shattered my uh, orbital bone. So the longer the fight went on, the, the bigger and bigger the swelling got. So in the fifth round, it was so swollen shut. And I was like moving around. And I could only like see him at certain times because of the swelling. It was, it was bad. And then I remember afterwards, I'm in the dressing room and my face is just, you know, I'm looking like Shrek. I'm looking, I'm looking bad. I'm covered in blood and all sorts. And Dana comes in and Dana's like, right, you got to go to the hospital. I'm like, I don't need to go to the hospital because I never wanted to go to the hospital afterwards because of my other eye. I did everything yeah. I could to never go to the hospital, right? And, and the staff came in and I was saying, no, no, no. So then Dana came in and said, you're going to the hospital. And I, I said, I'm fine. He goes, well, you don't fucking look it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then after I, I went to the hospital and, you know, my, my, you know, did what I needed to do. And then when I got back, it swelled up so much that I actually, it swelled shut. And I remember I was in the shower and uh, I couldn't see anything. You know, my, my coach, Daz, had to come in and, like, help me out of the shower in my bloody dick hanging out and everything. And <laughs> I got a bit emotional as well because, like, you know, it's a scary feeling, you know. It so, is. But, yeah, good times, good times. Good times. <laughs> well, no, I mean, like, hey, I understand. I will tell you, time. that that comeback as far as – because he did – he won the first round. I, I remember I was sitting I – was, I was in Randy Couture's living room watching the fight with him. And, obviously, Randy was a uh, – was a you know a teammate of, of Dan's for a long yeah. time. But we were watching the fight. And I said, yeah, Dan's up two rounds. And then you won, you win the third, and then you win the fourth. And I said, look, it comes down to this round right now, and Dan's tired. You know, I said, Mike's, Mike's got an issue. And you you win the, the fifth. I say you win the fifth. Randy goes, no, I think Dan's got it. I said, you are fucking hot. <laughs> <laughs> I said, there exactly. is no fucking way. You know, I said, hey. but... But it was... It was that's, that was one of those grind-em-out hard fights that... 
And everyone looks, you know, and they did. They looked at you had damage on your face, but it was from the first two rounds, and we go off of rounds, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And it was a, it was a, a, a tough fight for both of you, and you both gave it everything. It was, it was actually a beautiful repeat of a fight yeah. that was, you know, a rematch fight after you won the title. I don't think you could have asked for anything better. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you, John. And yeah, it was, and and full respect, you know, because we have this kind of joking. You know, we talk a bit of shit at each other now and again on Twitter. But again, I've yeah. got nothing against him. And he talk about a legend. Talk about yeah. one of the toughest yeah. individuals walking the face of planet Earth. And he did. He 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 put it on me those first two rounds. You know, it's not a man that you want to trifle with. Josh, I don't know if you know this, but there is an incredible product out there called Element. And I'm not talking E L. I'm talking L M N T. Element. One of the greatest drinks that you could have, especially if you are a runner, you're someone that's out hiking, rucking, which is a big thing right now, or if you're farming like me when it's really hot, I am telling you right now, Element is the drink that you want to have by your side. It is fantastic. It is loaded with sodium because your body needs sodium. Sodium is how it runs. It also has electrolytes and magnesium, other things that your body, magnesium is one of the most important things that you can put into it. Tell me right now, you're loving your element. I love it. I love the new watermelon flavor they just came out with. It's that is fantastic. Good. You know, it's funny. When we were younger, right, they used to say, if you eat too many eggs, right, you're, you'll have high cholesterol. Oh, yeah. All the lies. Yeah. And now, now they're saying that eggs is one of the leading nutrients basically for kids' development in their brain. Same thing with salt for me, right? My career was kind of taking a little bit of a downturn because I wasn't drinking enough water. And I wasn't able to actually keep the water in me. And so I noticed that my body... Was, wasn't able to maintain two, three training sessions a day. So I went to the doctor. I did a hydration test. They're like, man, you're so depleted of water. You're dehydrated. They said, so I had to start salt loading. Well, Element wasn't around back then. So I basically had to take really crappy salt and put it into my body. Man. Now that they have learned that there is different levels, I have learned there's levels to salt. They feature some of the most premium salt in Element. So if you guys can, check them out, man. They've got 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium, and they've got different flavors. They've got the grapefruit, they've got the raspberry, they've got the watermelon, citrus, black, black uh, got cherry, the citrus lime, flavors. citrus. Yeah. They've got all different types of flavors, and I enjoy them. And it's look, they come in a can, so you can just grab them on the go, or they come in little mix packets as well. That's so something nice. you can just grab the mix packet, buy a bottle of water, or bring a bottle of water with you if you're not ready to have it right then, and you can just mix it yourself. I also, this is the sparkling, which comes in the can. I love it. It's fantastic. It's quick on the go. Also too, my kids use this. So my kids, like my son, he's very competitive in sports. And so what I do is I'll pack one of these into his lacrosse bag or into his soccer bag, and he'll just have it available to him. Now I will say this one little caveat is make sure it's cold. Oh yeah. It is a lot more enjoyable when it is cold. Don't get me wrong. I can drink it when it's not. But let me just tell you, it's like cracking open a nice cold beer. It's, that's what it tastes like when it's cold. You crack it open, boom, put it down. It's fantastic. So it's something I can get on the go. So check it out, Element. Use the link in the descriptions down below. Every purchase you guys get through our link down below, they will actually send you a bonus package of uh, free products. Product. So whatever, yeah, free products. So check that out down below. I want to thank you guys for continuing to support us. Stay salty, my friends. I want to I want to go back to what you just said a second ago, saying that it was kind of an emotional moment coming out of the shower. <clears throat> you know, like I had a moment like that after my Tony Ferguson fight, where you know I'm cut up everywhere, fucking forty stitches here on the right side, three Mercedes Benz here, you know, fucking another forty something stitches in between the three cuts. You know, I'm in the shower, my body's I'm I'm shaking, like you know, and the water's on as hot as it could be, you know, and I'm fucking shaking. Just I had those moments, like what was the what was that moment for you like? Because like, mine was like just second guessing. Do I want to keep doing this? Is it worth it? What's going on? You know? Yeah, my, my, my worst one. Um, well, I fought George St. Pierre, got, uh, got clipped, took a short note, and I knew I was done then. I knew I was done fighting because I was on ah, the time. I was going to ask you this. With my eye injury, you know, I, I, I fought, well, I don't know, about 13 fights with one yeah. eye. You know what I'm saying? And I remember when I fought for the belt, my wife said, right, okay. If you win, are you going to retire? I said, if I lose, I'll retire. But if I win, you're out of your goddamn mind. You're making <laughs> you're championship right. money. That's this, is my where old, this is where the fun starts. Yeah, you're out um, of your mind. And obviously I won. And then when I lost the belt, I knew I was kind of done. 
right? But then Anderson Silva pissed hot. So the fight against Kelvin Gastelum was called off. They needed a last minute replacement. All I'd done for a week after the fight was just get drunk and not get drunk, but, you know, just drinking pizza and having beers and stuff, you know, not living the life of an athlete. I'd just done that for three months. Um, and I thought, fuck it. I'll roll the dice one more time, you know. Uh, and next minute, I'm on a plane over to China. Uh, I went out there to win, but I was so malnourished. I saw myself in, in the, um, my reflection in the mirror before I weighed in. I just looked pathetic. I'm like so overtrained and I had no business being there. And anyway, fair play. He gets me, he clips me. And then afterwards, uh, there was like an after party arranged by my manager. And we're in some like bougie club in Shanghai, China. And we're sitting there. And I know the symptoms of a detached retina because of the history with my right eye. And then I'm sitting there and my left eye starts having these weird issues. It's blinking and all this stuff's mm -hmm. going on. And I couldn't believe it because when I had the eye issues, doctors always said you shouldn't fight because, you know, if anything happens to your good eye, you're going to go blind. And I always used to think, well, light, a lot of people fight and they don't get a detached retina. So lightning struck. Lightning isn't going to strike twice. You know, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen twice. That was my attitude towards it. And I'm sitting there and I'm having a drink and I'm having these symptoms. I'm like, I don't believe it. Lightning struck twice. I'm going to go fucking blind. And uh, I could feel myself starting to cry. So I said, uh, I'm just going to go to the, uh, to the toilet, guys, uh, to the restroom. And I went off and I, I got out the... Uh, the bar, the club, whatever it was, just in time before I was just overcome with emotion. And I go back to my hotel room and I'm, I'm, I'm like, I don't believe this. I'm going to go blind. I've been here before. I know how this ends. Um, and then all my friends came back, my coaches, Perillo and everything. They all came back to the room and they realized I wasn't coming back from the restroom. And I was a bit emotional for a bit, but then, you know, we changed the subject, started having a few drinks and all the rest of it. Forget all about it. Anyway, Turns into quite the epic night. You know, the, the, what's that movie? The Hangover in, in, in the Thailand? Yeah. We had yeah. our own Hangover in Shanghai, right? <laughs> I come to, I'm on a plane flying back to LA. I have no idea how I've got there. And I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, water. I need water. And I've forgotten all about the eye issue. And then all of a sudden, I just start getting these flashes of light again. And I was like, oh, God. And then the anxiety and the worry and the panic and everything. Until I got back and saw a doctor and they said, right, okay, it's not a detached retina. It's a vitreous detachment. But, dude, you cannot fight again. I was like, yeah, don't worry. I'm done. And that was it. But that, that got... emotion <clears> – <throat> sorry, John, but I just want to touch <laughs> more on that emotion. Like, were you thinking like you, – you, you're thinking you were already done. But were, had you started thinking about what was next? Like before that last fight with Gaslam and when that emotion hit you, I mean, was it better for you to handle it alone or was it better for you to have your friends around you? No, you no, I, I, I don't really have a big circle of friends. I mean, I have a lot of friends, but it's just mm -hmm. me and my wife. You know what I mean? We're, we're, we're just the team, simple as that. Do you know what I mean? Uh, Perillo is one of my closest friends and he's a great guy to talk to. But for me, I knew the end was around the corner in 2013, when I had the issues with the eye, every single fight, I knew I was on borrowed time, you know? So I was looking at my exit strategy uh, the whole time and things I could do. And in hindsight, it was a blessing in disguise because I was able to stick around the sport for a good few more years and do some great things. Um, and I was able to build a platform while people still cared. Because when yeah. you're a retired, washed up fighter, no one cares anymore. But when you're, you start doing a podcast and you start doing this and you're having a little bit of dipping your toe in the acting world and this, that, and the other, you've got more opportunities because you're currently still fighting. You know, the world's full of retired fighters that want to still be in the limelight. So yeah. it was the best thing that ever happened to me. In hindsight, I guess, you know, you look at it through a positive lens. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I always thought this next fight's my last or even the next fight, I won't make it. I'm going to get to the wings. The doctor's going to say, how many fingers am I holding up? And I won't be able to tell it, <laughs> you know? So yeah, yeah. I, 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 I uh, kept it going for a while. I, I was going to ask you about the George St. Pierre fight. You know, I was the referee for it. And in the beginning, he was doing well in that fight. You were having problems. And I know you had a rib injury. J yeah. Jason was very good at telling me to watch for certain things, you know, that, you know, don't stop the fight, but no, he's, he's got a problem here. You know, and so I knew that when you started the fight and you could see that you were having some problems 
Uh, I didn't know that you were thinking about taking an injection or something like that. I heard that you were, you were <laughs> thinking about that and think I might kill myself or something. But yeah, no, what, what, what's it called? What's it called? I forget. Lidocaine. Lidocaine. Yeah. The the last sparring session, I had the best camp of my life. And you, 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 you don't mean to do it, but I'm knocking everyone out in training. I'm like, I'm feeling like a killer. I'm like, I'm going to smoke <laughs> Joe St. Pierre. I'm like, let's do one last day. We were flying on the Saturday. On the Friday, we have a sparring session. A guy takes me down, lands on top of me, and I just feel oh. attacked. And I'm like, and you know what it's like? I, I think I just tore all the cartilage and I went to see a doctor. He's like, you ain't fighting next week. It's going to be a while. I'm like, you don't understand. I've got one. <laughs> I'm the champion. It's George St. Pierre in his comeback fight. It's going to be a big pay-per-view. This is going to be a real payday. I am Hello. showing up to that fight regardless. Whether I have, I have one leg, one arm. Yeah. Well, I did. I had no ribs, one eye, half a brain cell. I'm like, fuck you. We're going New York regardless. I've got to get that payday. And anyway, so the doctor says, right, he says, uh, what you can do is you can inject yourself with lidocaine uh, and it will numb the pain for about an hour. So I checked, and it's not a banned, uh, it's not a banned thing. So I said to someone, I said, I'll go to the, he said, you might want to check with the commission, but if you go to the commission and tell them you're injured, they won't let you yeah, fight. You're done. So I'm like, ooh. So I gave it some thought, and the doctor said, well, be careful when you do it, because you could punch your lung and die as well. <laughs> so the game plan was I was going to go to the toilet in Madison Square Garden when all the commission are hounding. I was going to pull this needle that I've sneaked in out of my bag, FaceTime someone, he was going to talk me through it and inject the lidocaine into my ribs to try and dull the pain. And I was in there and I just thought, what in the fuck this? What is going on? You know, no, <laughs> I'm not doing this. So yeah, I went out there, people were like, you didn't seem yourself. I'm like, yeah. No, no you shit. didn't. I couldn't move. Not in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> you you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. But, but, you know, as the fight started going, somewhere, you know, towards the, probably the last two minutes or minute and a half of the second round, you started to take over in that fight. And then in the third round, you were really taken over. Yeah. And he caught you with a shot. And this, and I, you know, people say, say all kinds of stuff. Oh, John, you, you know, you're always bagging on the UFC. I love the UFC, but if there was one thing I was mad about was when you lost that fight, I had to say, look, he lost by, you know, submission due to a rear, rear naked choke, but it was the punch that put you in that position. Yeah. You know, you, you got hit with a shot that hurt you. And then 20, 20 days later, you were fighting Kelvin Gastelum. I go, that's just fucking wrong. He should not yeah, be fighting you Kelvin. Know, you know, I had to do so many medicals. It really pissed me off, actually, because I had hardly any time to prepare for that. Uh, and I had to go for MRIs. I had to do my eye test again. I had to do physicals. They put me through everything, everything. And I was like, I've just done these. For New York. I've just done these. I've just done them. And they're like, we yeah. don't care. You just yeah. fought. You lost. We want you to go through all the testing again. And it yeah. really pissed me off. But to your point, I understand why you're saying that. And I know well, you're you know, no, the, the reason why is, you know, and fighters could hate me at the time. When it when it comes to like a knockout, and you, you even say it when we talk about it, uh, you're, when you're commentating. Under the unified rules, a knockout is when a fighter cannot intelligently defend himself cannot meaning they don't have the function brain wise it doesn't mean yeah. that they're unconscious a, a tko is when they are not intelligently defending themselves meaning their brain's still there but they're just not doing the right things and when you look at that when i am the referee and i say ko that means that you as the fighter you don't get to fight for 90 days yeah because i want your brain to to get time to you know heal up from what occurred in that and when it was 20 days, it, I just looked and I said, man, see, that's what drives me crazy about fighting is right now they're using Michael Bisping's reputation and name to get Kelvin Gastelum over. Nothing against Kelvin. I love Kelvin. But I just looked at it. It's like they're, they're taking the lion who is the champion, yeah, nah, and now he's nah, not, nah. and they're letting his pelt go. I, I understand what you're saying, and I appreciate you uh, kind of having my back in that regard. But I was driving out to lunch with uh, my wife, and I had my, my in-laws, my father and my wife's parents in the back of the car. We're driving out to the filling station. It's a little restaurant. We'll go for eggs and stuff. I and know we were listening station. to Sirius XM radio. And there was a little show, a, a MMA show. I forget what it was. And it, come on, it came on there. And they were talking about it. And I said, I'm driving. And I'm still black and blue from the George fire. And I'm like, 
<laughs> I think I'm going to put my name in for that fight. They went, you can't, you can't. I said, I can. And I text Dana right then and there. And they're, like, and they're going, you're crazy. And Dana's like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, I'm 100% serious. I'm like, listen, I got into this for the money. If I can fucking roll the dice, <laughs> finish on a win, get another nice payday out of it, and, and stack it up in the bank account, this is why I do it for my family. And and like, and I went to win. I didn't go to yeah. lose. I didn't oh, show no, up no for doubt. a payday. I thought, and I was pissed off because I had a bad taste in my mouth. I thought, I can turn this around. I can beat this guy. But obviously, you're right. The shot was a good one. He choked me out. But, you know, yeah. that The only reason I was there is because I made it happen. <laughs> okay. That's right. Ultimately, it comes down to the fighters. Ultimately, it does. It does. Ultimately, it always does come down to that. Yeah. But I want to. I want to take some steps forward though, and talk about, you know, you being kind of the one that led the way for the UK market, and then now you know you have Leon and now Tom Aspinall, who I, John knows that I've been I've been high on Tom Aspinall since he walked into the cage. I was like, this guy can move. He's, He's good off monster. of his back. If he had a little bit better wrestling, like his jujitsu is great. I'm talking about just his wrestling to deal with heavyweights, like, and he would dominate. I, I think he's going to end up dominating. Just my point of view is he's so talented and gifted on the ground, and now that you're seeing his striking, he's got the power, he's got the movement, the lateral movement, all of these things. Does it give you some self gratification? I guess to be a little bit more selfish, be like, hey, I kind of led the way. I kind of opened the door to let him know we've got great talent over here. Yeah, I mean, yes and no, you know, because. People always say that, and it's and, and I do like it when I go back to England and we're commentating a fight there. A lot of the fighters, they call me Uncle Mike, you know, and I like it. You know, it's like, all right, I'm an old bastard. I get it, thank you. <laughs> but it, but it's, there's, it's a term of endearment, you know, and I do like it when they call me that. Uh, but there was people before me, there was Ian the Machine Freeman. Ian you know, Freeman. He's, he's, he was the true pioneer. I, I trained with Ian in the early days. Yeah. Uh, so there was people before me, but I'm also aware that no one had a, an impact like I did and I won the ultimate fighter and yada, yada, yada. I know the best of it. I don't need to go through it. Uh, so, yeah, I definitely played my part. I know I did. And, yeah, I'm, I am proud to see UFC so widely recognized now in the UK. But the success of the fighters and what they do, that's got nothing to do with me. You know, I mean, they, they, they do it all themselves. They work their ass off. It would be very, very arrogant to sit here and be like, yeah, look at what I created. You know, it, I, I was just doing me. I was just trying to look after my wife and kids. I didn't give a shit if I was inspiring anyone. I was doing yeah. it for selfish reasons. Great. Awesome. People saw it and thought, fuck, that seems cool. Let's give it a try. Great. Good. That wasn't Brutal what I was trying honesty. to do. <laughs> Brutal honesty. <laughs> that I wasn't love it. what I was trying to do. I was trying to, trying to make a living because I left school at 16 and had zero qualifications. What's your, when you look at Leon, where is he going to go from here? Where does he have to go from here? I mean, he's obviously still got a lot left in the can. He is a talented guy. I've trained with him. I've grappled with him, trained, sparred with him. He's so, he's fantastic. Tom Aspinall, uh, never met, have never been around, but I mean, just watch him in the cage. He flows. I mean, what are your thoughts on those two guys? Yeah, well, uh, Tom can wrestle at a very, very high level. Let okay. me tell you, he's, he's a really, really good wrestler as well. So he's the whole package. I always say he's a heavyweight George St. Pierre. He really is. And and I said this a while ago that, you know, John Jones couldn't hold a candle to him. And maybe that's a bit of a wild statement, but I think John <laughs> would have his hands full for sure. And Tom would also have his hands full, you know. So, but if you put a gun to my head, I'd put my money on Tom because I've said that and I'll stick to my guns. Um, Leon Edwards obviously had a great run. Defended the belt a couple of times. So, like, if he wants to continue fighting and become the champion again, that's amazing. And I respect that. But he's kind of, he did it. He's a kid from yeah. Birmingham that came from very, very little. You know, a lot of Americans kind of have this idea that, you know, the UK are all posh and, you know, we're all born with a silver spoon in our mouth. You know, it ain't the case at all. You get outside of the shiny parts of London, a lot of the country is a shithole and people are struggling and there's like nasty areas. And he's from a really tough area. His father, his father was killed in gang violence and he was able to escape all of that and turn it into a positive, became champion of the world. You know, it's inspiration inspirational um of course he's still gonna fight you know um i'm not sure who it is next i thought maybe michael ben and page would be a great matchup yeah in fact i've got the rankings right here let's have a look right now hold on <laughs> shab kamaru usman is he gonna match up 
Jack I mean, Della if, Madalena, that'd be a fun one. But that'd I think be a great fight. As well. that would be, yeah. The two of them would be a fun fight. Yeah. Fantastic fight. But I mean, like I said, I would just wanted to get your fit take on them and like Tom Aspinall having just basically no one really left in front of him outside of the John Tom, Jones and go Tommy's going to go down. And I said this to his face. He's going to go what? down as the greatest. He's oh. going to go down as the greatest. I thought you were saying he's going to be a light heavyweight. I go, I like, there's yeah. no oh, fucking oh, way. He's going to go down. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> I was like, what? I was like, wait he a can't do that. He can't go down. He'd have to chop a leg off to make yeah. that 205. No, he's going to go down as the greatest British mixed martial artist that ever lived. I truly believe that. You know, as, as grandiose as I want my career to be, it's like Tom's the man. He, he's he, John Jones has said himself he may retire. And if he doesn't retire, you know, um, if he does or doesn't, whatever, Tom's still going to be yeah. around. He's a young man. And I don't see anybody else. Yes, yeah, Cyril Garn on the feet could compete, but Tom can wrestle really well. Uh, okay. he, he's going to defend the belt six, seven, as yeah. many times as he chooses. And then he'll retire with a fortune in the bank. And, and yeah, with the title of probably the greatest fighter to ever come out of the UK. What makes him different than anybody else has come before him in that heavyweight division? I mean, outside of, outside of just his skill level, his athleticism, all those things, but what makes his mindset different? I know he's got his father's constantly with him, always with yeah. him. And uh, what is he doing differently than the people that have come before him? Then? Well, I don't think he's, I mean, obviously all the obvious things, he works hard and he's humble and all the rest of it. And many people are like that. Um, but when you just look at the heavyweight division and you look at a lot of them, and then you look at Tom, the man's an athlete. He's yeah. a real athlete. Again, I liken him to George St. Pierre, but in a much, much bigger body frame. He was teaching adults jujitsu when he was 15 years old. He's got ridiculously high level jujitsu. He moves. He's like Muhammad Ali on the feet. He floats like a butterfly, stings like a bee. He's got the whole package. He's young. He's explosive. He's got knockout power and all the other inspirational. He's, he's a hard worker. He's the first one to arrive and the last one to leave and all that fucking bullshit. <laughs> but it's true. He is that guy. He's the, he works his ass off. He's very humble and he's extremely talented. And his father has coached him from a very early age as well. Let, let me ask you this then about, because if, if there was another, one thing that bothers me about this whole situation is John Jones is the undisputed champion. Tom Aspinall is the interim champion. Yeah. But John Jones is not fighting Tom Aspinall. He's fighting Stipe. <laughs> it just, yeah, you just no, look no, and go, no. it doesn't make sense. Well, I know, can, I know I, the whole thing was careful. Stipe don't everything. perjure yourself. I know. Don't no, perjure no, yourself. No, perjure no, yourself. No, no, no. <laughs> That's a John Anik line right there. Don't perjure yourself. Listen, but listen, but listen. When, when, have, when have we ever had the interim champion sitting while and, and uninjured? While the undisputed fights somebody else. So the reason I'm laughing is because when I say this, everyone's going to go, God, he's such a company man. Right? He's such a shill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what they're going to say. But this is actually how I feel. And I was having an argument with my son, Callum, who's a massive MMA fan. I mean, he's, he, I go in his I was a great wrestler. He, yeah, he was a great wrestler. Great wrestler. And, and, and uh, Tom was bullying him the prick because Callum <laughs> went out and trained with him for a while. <laughs> no, but Callum knows a lot about MMA. He's very opinionated. And uh, we were arguing about this. He's like, he said the same thing you said. He said, I don't. That's because Kellen's very intelligent. He is an intelligent guy. Okay, so you, you should listen to him. All. He doesn't know <laughs> it all. Uh, I'm like, son. And it was actually Anthony Smith that said this when we were doing our podcast. He said this point to me first and it made me realize it. He, he, Anthony said, and I'll just say, it, that fight, that interim title fight happened because Stipe got injured. Because Stipe got injured. Tom and Sergey got an opportunity to fight for the interim title and they both wanted to fight each other. So they agreed to postpone it. Right. So that it was always going to be postponed. They both agreed to it. So we'll do it at a later date. Now they made Tom versus Sergey for the interim strap. Maybe in hindsight, maybe that created a bit of confusion and backlog and all this fucking controversy online, you know, mm -hmm. but they did that to spice it up, I reckon, because it's, it was a hit to the card. You know, but that fight was always set in stone. Nothing's changed there. The reality is, is that Tom smoked Sergei Pavlovich and has continued to fight as well. You know, but he will be the next guy. But I don't know. I don't. I'm not Dana. I'm not Hunter Campbell. I don't make this fucking decision. <laughs> but when you look at it like that, it it kind of makes sense. Hmm. Because Dana said as well, and, and I and again, it's look like I'm being the shill, but but he said a good point at a at a. Uh, 
a press conference after the contender. Um, he said, and by the way, Stipe has been a great champion. He's been a great fighter. This will be his last fight. What am I meant to do? Just say, nah, sorry, Stipe, you're out of luck. You want it. John Jones wants it, but now nah, fuck you, we're moving on. He said, mm. So like, he's, he's screwed if he does or if he doesn't. If he did yeah. that, then, oh my God, look at how he's treating Stipe. You, that's what people would say. And he's not doing yeah. it now. They're like, oh, this is bullshit, you know? So it's like, people are going to complain. People are going to whinge. You know, Tom's going to get his hands on one of them. You're damned if you do, damned if you don't, if you're in that promoter yeah. shoe, hey, you know, hey. whether you're the matchmaker or the promoter. I've I've got no skin in this game. I could not care less. I'm just giving my opinion. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, look, in the analyst uh, shoes, when you put your analyst shoes on here, buddy, um, do you sometimes feel like you can be a little biased towards the UK guys? Nope. No. In fact, the opposite. The opposite. So that's are you, what are you sure? Are you serious? Yes. I like this. Good answer, Mike. One hundred percent sure. If anything, I go the other way because I know all you little virgins <laughs> like to go on about stuff like that. So just engage it when Leon fought Kamaru Usman for the third time in London. Um, Gagey afterwards was like, you know, oh, Bisman should never be near. See, like, but Gagey's got skin in the game. That's his Gagey teammate. Is the <laughs> it's teammate. the guy he trains with. Yes. It's and like, it's like, and I don't blame I him for that. being that way. I totally understand yes, it. He should be. Here's what I said uh, I, on my podcast. I was like, I understand why Gagey does that because when you watch a fight and you have a relationship with somebody, you perceive it a certain way. Everything Absolutely. that they do well is like emphasized. A little bit better. Person does well is like diminished. You're like, ah, I wasn't that good. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So Gagey's watching me give props to Leon who rightly won the fight, and he's like, he should never be near a microphone. Anyway, as it happens, he apologized. He said, I shouldn't have said that. So everyone that has an issue, go fuck yourself. Uh, <laughs> uh, hey, uh, I only got a couple more things, but I really want to talk to you about um, your life after fighting. Like spending more time at home with the family, with the wife, the kids, being out, being accessible 100% of the time, you know, when you're not traveling for, you know, for, for being an analyst. Yep with the UFC, but how, how exciting is it to actually be there side by side with your kids for whether it's sporting events or when you're traveling as a family and not always have to be focused on being in the gym every single day. And I know you've also biz, business, uh, business out into some things, you know, I think you own a gym, a UFC gym, correct in Costa Mesa, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I think with cub, I think cub Swansa is a partner yeah. with you on that or something. So, I mean, how is that going for you guys and what other things are you guys work, working on? Yeah, I've got my fingers in a few pies, you know, here and there. I'm busy. I've got lots of little adventures and stuff going on and bits of investment. Some are good, some are bad. You know what I mean? But I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Because everyone would be like, shut the hell up. No one cares. You know what I mean? We're all living well, life. Life's well, what, good. Life's one good, of the, One of the things that you are part of and you keep on doing continuously over and over, Mike, you've turned into a damn good actor. You're doing good with it. That's that's how you know the whole yeah. Justin Gaethje thing. And I was, Mike is in a movie that I'm with, and Justin Gaethje's there, and Kamaru Usman. So it's yeah. like, you know, it's one of those. You've really taken off with acting. You know, a lot of people, you know, get into you know one show and then they kind of fit. You keep on going back and doing it over and over. How is the whole career with the acting playing out? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's, it's a tough gig, right? Everyone wants to be an actor or whatever. Not everyone, but you know what I mean. It's, it's, yeah. A lot of people would like to do that. And I never thought I'd sit here and say that I'm doing this. It just kind of happened by accident. <laughs> Tap Out were making these crappy films back in the day because they were making so much money and probably wanted a tax write-off. And then I got <laughs> a, a, an offer to be like one of the leading roles in a film, and I've never acted, but I went and did it. I did a pretty good job. I really enjoyed the process. Moved out. Oh, then I did a bit of a soul opera called Hollyoaks in the UK. Moved out to here. I thought, well, I'm, I'm in LA. You know, might as well try and get an agent. And then just bit by bit doing little parts here and there. And then did that movie with Vin Diesel and some other roles. When I've got Den of Thieves 2 coming out soon. Got Red Sonja. Got four films actually waiting to be released. Wow. Um, but it's it, they're, they're all just like little parts. You know, you ain't paying the bills with it yeah, you know no. but it's all it's all i mean I, hopefully early next year i've got my first lead role 
Uh, and it's a really, really good script. I say hopefully because, you know, we were supposed to go in August, then we were going to go in November. Now, hopefully we'll go in early next year. But that's kind of how it goes. But it's a really yeah. good script, and I'm excited for the opportunity. But I take it all with a grain of salt. You know what I mean? I, I still don't, because I, I, I filmed Red Sonja two years ago in Bulgaria. And an actor on there, Luca Pasqualino, a British guy, really, really good guy. We became good friends. And he, he said to me, he said, why do you always never allow people to call you an actor? Because I was like, oh, no, no, I'm not an actor. I'm not an actor. I'm not an actor. No, you are. You're an actor, Mike. I'm, I'm not an actor. He went, you are. You're an actor. And we did this. Well, scene. you're playing one. He goes, well, look at, and I, I was crying in this scene and stuff. He says, look at that. You're an actor. I said, no, I'm not. I'm a fighter that does a bit of acting. I'm not an actor. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm well aware. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm, I would never, ever have the audacity to walk around and say, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm an actor. I'd say, yeah. the day I say that, slap me in the fucking <laughs> face. Okay? Yeah, I'm, I enjoy I, it. I'm telling you, Mike, from now on, I'm going to say he's an actor who used <laughs> to fight. <Just> gonna... <laughs> when you Google me, it says actor. And Jason really? loves to send me that. <laughs> and and that he'll, he's had a few drinks. He'll be buzzed on a Friday night and I'll get a voice note. He goes, oh, fucking actor. Actor. Okay. <laughs> we're going to refilm the intro after you after you hop off. And we're going to basically say, if we're going to introduce the actor. Our <laughs> actor exactly. friend. Our actor exactly. friend. Oh, that's yeah. awesome, man. Um, I guess, look, I just wanted to say, man, congratulations on an amazing career, man. You've been doing a wonderful job. Uh, as an analyst and uh you know <clears throat> it's not an easy job i think fighters they think they're just going to roll right into it with no research and just speak off the cuff and it doesn't work that way you've got to spend your time you got to spend as much time as you do inside that that gym getting good at your craft as you do behind behind closed doors learning about these other athletes that are stepping up because ultimately we got to do a job you know when we're an analyst especially like yourself you've got to do a job that gives people access to those fighters that are on the undercard and you have to do them a justice because they deserve that. They've put in the work like we did when we were younger, you know, that's all we wanted was for someone at that level to say our name and to give us some notoriety and, and boost our egos up and make us even bigger than we were. So we felt driven for it. I think you do a fantastic job at it. man. No, well, thank you, Josh. I appreciate that. And yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. I try and the first person on the prelims, I give them well, I give them more attention than the main event because the main event, you're already aware of them anyway. Yeah. You know their career and you've seen them come up. But the earlier guys, this is their big moment. Certainly when they're making the UFC debut, it's like they have dreamed of this moment for so long. You know, so I, I, I try and give them the same respect and energy as what I would do the main event. But thank you for the kind words. I, I do appreciate it. A lot of people do think it's easy. I remember when the UFC first got on Fox and I'd sit there and I'd see like some of the other analysts. I'd be like, oh, these guys suck. They suck. And then I got to go. And then next minute, you're in a TV studio and there's yeah. cameras everywhere. <laughs> And you can't swallow, and you're like, it's a little bit harder <laughs> yeah. under the bright lights. Some guys in your ear telling you, okay, yeah. ready, go, yeah. three, yeah. two, one. Or he's oh, like, yeah. hey, wrap people, it up, wrap it up, right. 10 people seconds. Six, seven, six, talking. five. People have no idea. <laughs> They've it's a, yeah. You know, and ultimately, this is why I love it, because it's just like us sitting here talking about fights. That's why I love it. And the fights are fantastic, and it's like my expert subject, if you will. And thank God I can still use it to make a living. Uh, and, and I absolutely love it. But yeah, it's not quite as easy as what everybody no, thinks. It's not. Hey, do me a favor. Give a time for uh, you. Have a fantastic podcast with Anthony Smith. Believe you me. You've been wow. doing the Believe You Me for a long time. You used to have a different partner. Now it's Anthony Smith who's doing a great job with you. When can people see your show? Yeah, well, thanks, John. Uh, I'm not really one for plugs, but yeah, Believe You Me podcast. Mondays and Thursdays, YouTube, wherever you get, uh, you know, audio podcast and all that stuff. Yeah, Anthony, uh, he's great. We have him on Mondays, but he's a busy man. He's a very, very busy man. He's doing analyst work. He's on a cruise right now. Hold, it, hold right. it, hold it, hold it. He's a busy man. He's doing analyst work. What the hell do you do? <laughs> Bro, this is what people say. Because like we were to, we talk about a lot of non-MMA stuff, you know, yeah. and we were talking about a subject recently uh, that – you know, the majority, a lot more people are working from home these days. And we were talking about it. I'm like, 
people need to get out the house. People should be forced to go yeah. back into the workplace, to socialize, to, to speak to someone at the water cooler, or when you're getting a sandwich, put money into the economy, get on a train or a bus and just socialize. Good for your mental health, as opposed to sitting in the house or there by yourself at a computer. I'm like, get out there. And then people in the comments were like, oh, the nerve of these guys to say that whilst they're sitting in their house doing a <laughs> podcast. I'm like, yeah. And it's one of the only days I'll be in the house. I'm going to France. I'm going to here. I'm going oh, to yeah. China. I'm all over the bloody place. Yeah. Uh, anyway. I mean, people, man, they just want to judge us from the outside, judge people from the outside. <laughs> That's all they want to do. Uh, well, hey, man, well, it's it's – it's been awesome having you on. I appreciate you. And obviously I'd love to try to have um, maybe some cross promotion. I, and I've said this Absolutely. before a couple of times. We had John Anik on, Kenny Florian. And I was like, look, I want to give the younger guys that are coming up or the ones that are about to retire. He's not They're talking about you, Mike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I would like, I would like, and I see the way that Joe Rogan is with a lot of his comedian friends. He's constantly having them on. He's constantly like pumping up, letting them know when their specials are, when people, when they have something big coming up. And I feel like in the MMA world, you know, we all know each other. We've all shared blood with each other. We've all been in the cage. We've trained together. The majority of us have all trained together in other gyms. It's just trying to help each other grow, whatever it is after fighting. Make them feel like they're not alone, you know, and let them know like, hey, if we can get you on the podcast, you guys have th something you guys want to push. I'd like to try to influence all the other guys like yourself and Anik and those guys to try to have them on and be like, hey. What's your next adventure after you've retired or after you've, you're ready to move on or getting towards the end? Because it's a lonely part, I think, for a lot of them to leave the sport because yeah. that's all they've known for 22 years, 25 years, whatever it is. You know, the ones that have done it for a long time. So, um, you know, you and I are both retired, but I want to make it vocal just to fighters. If you guys are on your way out or you feel like it, it's easier to build your brand now for your next step. So if you have something that's kind of on your mind, you want a, a business adventure, you want to try to put out there. Hit, hit me up, you know, uh, the Wayne in podcast and, you know, even biz being and stuff and, and just let us know. I mean, like, let's have a conversation about hosting these guys and uh, getting the awareness for them just so they can start building their next step, you know, to move forward. Yeah. Very well said, Josh. Very, very well said. And I stand by that as well. Anyway, thanks for having me on Josh. Always, always a pleasure. John, big John, you're an absolute <laughs> fountain of knowledge. Uh, when we were on a set recently, I was like, I thought I knew a lot about MMA. Oh, no. Holy <laughs> shit. I'm it's sorry. disgusting. <laughs> it's, try having, try doing a show with this guy because I'm never yeah. fucking right. I'm never yeah, yeah, fucking exactly. right. Hold on, that's all you it. say is I'm always right. That's, I, that's your line. I, I pat myself on the back when I am right for yeah. once and he's wrong. I'm like, yeah, take that, baby. Take yeah, it. yeah. That one time it happened. Fellas, yeah. I'm going to jump off. All the best. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for having me on. Really, Mike, thank that. you so much Thanks, for brother. your time. And ladies and gentlemen, the champ, the man who's on the screen all the time with great commentary, Michael Bisping. You take care, brother. Thanks, guys. All the best. Bye-bye. Josh, we were lucky enough to be able to continue our relationship with OnlyFans. Now, OnlyFans started out as a basic way for people to be able to come together with people of knowledge in sports. Yeah, it went in different directions, but we're trying to bring them back to sports because sports is where it's at. We have so many people in the MMA world, the boxing world, the surfing world that are on OF, and you can be a fan of theirs. You can go to OF. If you don't want to see any of the girl stuff, you don't have to. It'll never come up in your feed. Only sports is what you want. Well, only sports is what you're going to get. That's true, man. Look, a lot of fighters have jumped, jumped on this bandwagon like we did when we first started working with OnlyFans. So when I started off with OnlyFans, we were the very first podcast that they've ever worked with. And then we led them into signing. Just say that again. Great yes, kid. we, we were. are the only Thank podcast. The we were the first. first podcast that they ever worked with when they signed with us. So we, uh, we, uh, we've actually helped open up the doors for a lot of other top talented fighters to sign on the bandwagon. So with the only fans, you've got Demetrius Johnson is on there. Luke Rockhold is on there. AJ McKee is on there. Chris Cyborg is on there. So many top athletes that are on there. Go ahead and check them out. Subscribe to them. Subscribe to us. It's fun for a little extra content. If you guys are looking for some more one on one connection, uh, with your favorite fighters and with your favorite podcast over here, go ahead and hit us up over there. And uh, look, we're going to, you guys will have access, ask questions so we can answer them a little bit more, a little bit more one-on-one -on -one with us on that, on that platform than you do get up with us on YouTube. So go ahead and head over to OnlyFans, subscribe to our Wayne in channel over there. It is free. It is free. There will be some, some content that we will put over there that will cost. 
And John and I are still working that out. But look, I know a lot of you guys ask questions about John's uh, refereeing seminar command. So I wanted to, where him and I are trying to figure out something out that we can do there. And also too, with me, a lot of you guys are hitting me up in my DMs. Hey, what about this in this technique in fighting? What about this in jujitsu? What about this in, in kickboxing? Why didn't the fighter do this? Well, if you guys want those kind of breakdowns, I'm going to go ahead and jump on a, on a video chat with you guys and do something over there. Or I can just go ahead and put it onto a video and place it up for you guys over there. And that's something that we can work on in terms of pay. So look, we're looking forward to continue our partnership with OnlyFans and uh, looking forward to seeing you guys over there. Subscribe to us over there at OnlyFans. Well, that was awesome having Mike on our show. This guy is, he is such a good person, Josh. People don't realize. They hear, you know, things about him and stuff and they watch his fighting style and everything and they get these ideas and these perceptions. You will not find a guy who's a better family man as far as he takes his wife with him everywhere. He takes care of his his kids still, you know. Cal, Callum is off in San Francisco. I know it's one of the things we were talking about, and San Francisco is so expensive now, as you know, yeah. since you used to live up that way. That you know, Mike has to supplement, you know, his his son because he can't make enough money to actually That's have hard. a place and and eat and mm -hmm. you know do the things he needs to do. So Michael Biss being one of the best people it's ever been in MMA both in the ring and outside of it. Just an amazing man. Yeah, I mean, like, for me, I felt like I was listening to a replay of how people look at him and perceive him as to the way people looked at me and perceived me. Very similar. You know, I mean, the the nickname, the punk, and, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, those type of things. I get it. And when I was younger, and I wanted to talk more about it, but I also, too, I could realize he was getting uncomfortable, you know, neck, back, and all that stuff sitting, yeah, is that it comes down to, that we were very brash when we were younger and you know spoke was on our mind and if it, if it came to our mind it came out of our mouth <laughs> and and uh that wasn't always the best and uh to see like he's exactly where i'm at too right now in terms of when you you just don't have that 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 you have that fight in you if you want to you want to kind of what is it called like you know rattle the cage of the dog or something oh come you, you want to poke the bear the bear can come yeah. back out of the cave exactly yeah. it's just but i don't i don't have it in me like i don't have it there anymore yeah. you know but the feeling though you know you could still rise if you need to you just choose not to and like the conversations with with my kids are completely different than the conversations i had with my dad <laughs> you know what i mean and um well yeah, you know what's what it's funny is one of the things and it, this is not with mike because i know mike's kids knew everything he did you know when we first started talking and getting together yeah, you said my son doesn't even know that I fought. Yeah, right. And I was like, "Why not?" You know, and I thought it was something that was like you were trying to hide from him. And it's not so much you were trying to hide it from him, but it was like you also didn't really want him to know because it was something you didn't want him to go towards. You know? Yeah, it's, it's not even so much wanting him to go towards. It's just like, look, if you want to wrestle, I'm all for you wrestling. <clears throat> you want to train jujitsu, I'm all for you training jujitsu. I don't want to. I don't want to give an expectation for my son to have to live up to. That's one. I don't want to plan it in his mind that he needs to be, to do the things that I did. I love that he plays lacrosse. I never played lacrosse. Yeah. I love it. I love that there's no, there's nothing that I can teach him Just about that. Stepping he into needs, his own shoes. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. Uh, he does play soccer. I can teach him a lot about that. But I also like that I don't have to because he's got great coaches. You know, uh, the wrestling and jiu-jitsu part of it, I can teach a lot of that to him as well. Uh, we spend less time doing that because he's so involved in lacrosse and soccer. But I guess for me, it just, you know, it was uh, the maturity factor. The, you know, he was talking the stories about, you know, guys hitting him and this and that. I've I've had a couple of those scenarios where guys hit me and you're just like, gosh, man, if you only knew what you're getting yourself into, <laughs> you know, and you just, you just laugh about, you have a smile and you laugh. I, I give you guys a quick story. I was, I just got done fighting. It was a fight at the San Jose arena. We were at a club. And a younger kid, it was See, one of Kung Lee's. It's always of, at a club. It was at a club, but it was one of Kung Lee's students. And he got a little mouthy with me. And I just said, hey, I said, you better put yourself in check. He fucking slapped me. Slap, not punch. Ah, he slapped me. Stockton slapped you. And I just looked at him like, and I just started laughing. I couldn't get mad at him because I could tell he was a young kid. And it was, he's like, no, come on, man. I got, I could do, I was like, no, no, like, you can't do this. I will. I will destroy you. There's just there's something that goes through your mind. But, and, see, um, they, but you can do that when you know. When you know. When you know. Yeah, you, you have no idea 
what's going to happen to you. Yeah. Because then you can have the confidence to say, it's all right, I'm the one deciding not to make it happen. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because when you're capable of that type of violence, yep. you there's a sense of calmness that comes over you. Yeah, and because fighting's not a big deal. It's not. It's not a big deal. There's no sense of I'm not excited about it. Anymore. Yeah, you don't get you don't get the adrenaline all I don't get the adrenaline. No. I, I have the expectation of I know exactly what's gonna happen. You know, as I'm gonna shoot a double leg, I'm gonna take you down, and once you get on bottom, you're not getting up. I'm like I'm pound, just gonna I'm gonna pound you till you you're Yeah, asleep. you know, and <laughs> It's just, it, and so when he was telling that story about the guy hit him and it didn't really even hurt and he just like laughed, he's like, gosh, what I've been there. And just, we, I felt like there was a lot of things that I could relate to with him going through the retirement phase of, you know, and then that feeling of, you know, I had that same type of feeling in the Tony Ferguson fight, man, like the shivering in the shower, yeah, the, the body well, was in shock. Come on. It's just a, a it, lot of things. It's when it, you got to look at it and say, how many fights did you have? How many fights did he have? Mm -hmm. where he never had that feeling of it's almost a panic because you're having a feeling that you've never had before. Truthfully, it's, it's something that's different. And now all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're in there and you're shaking and you can't control it. It's like, why you don't yeah. know, you don't know why <clears throat> he's in the shower. And all of a sudden I can't see, you know, those things, you know, that's never happened before. And so, yeah. You can look and go, yeah, I understand why you started to panic on it. It's, it's well, especially a, it's, at that stage of your career. If it was, yeah. if that had happened like in, you uh, know, not fight six early. or seven or 10 or 12, that's one thing. But in, it fight 40 or fight 30, you know, when you're 38 years old or 30 or 40 years old, somewhere around there, you really start thinking and taking a look at yourself in the mirror, especially in the bathroom, in the back, in the locker room going, fuck, man, what am I doing? And so I just wanted to get that, that feeling from him, you know, like, what was it like? Cause it's not easy. It's I, I want, I guess people should understand that there's a lot of emotion that goes, like he said, he left the club and he started kind of getting all emotional. There's a lot that goes through our minds, you know, like I want to keep fighting cause I want to support my family. I want to keep fighting cause I want to support myself. I want to be able to eat. I don't know how much longer. I don't know what where, else I need. I, what else can I do? What else can I do? How long will the money that I have last me yeah. to get me to whatever it is I want to do next? Yeah. There's a lot that goes through fighters' minds. Like we spent 20 years, you know, doing this. What is next? And will it and we know it's never gonna generate the amount of money we were making. I was making good money at that time. He was making more money than me because he came a little bit later and at the end there. I mean, shit. You know, at the time that he was exploding, it was perfect time and opportunity to collect some big checks. Yep. So good on him, man. But you still have that question. Like, okay, look, I got two kids to put through college. How long, you know, I've got kids to put through college. That's going to cost money. There's a lot that goes through fighters' minds, you know, sure. like, how am I going to continue to, to support my family? Overall, though, uh, I just had, I had to say it, man, just an overall uh, good person. I trained with him one time, you know, a couple, actually it was a couple of times, but it was in one week uh, at, uh, at Huntington Beach, at Tiki's gym, old gym. Huh. It was one of the old facilities there. We trained together, did some cage stuff, some wall stuff and everything. And, uh, you know. I just, it was funny because I walked into that going, they're like, oh yeah, Bisbee's going to be here later. I'm like, all right, cool. Do some wall drills. I'm like, all right, cool. And I was like, oh man, this guy, we're going to do wall drills. This guy sucks. That was, that's what went through my mind. Yeah. And then I, he got there and we trained and I was like, well. he's way better than I thought. Yeah. He's got well, more, he's got he good be, elbow control. He's he got good arm. He became a very good defensive wrestler based upon, yeah. that was how he was going to survive. But I, that was one of the things that I thought actually he got out of the ultimate fighter and he had a chip on his shoulder based upon the Tito and Matt yeah. Hamill relationship, but it was, I'm going to beat your fucking wrestler. Now he did. And it was a controversial fight because it was in England. He ended up fighting Matt Hamill and he got the mm -hmm. win. But I think that Mike based upon that whole situation said, I got to learn how to wrestle. Yeah. And he did. He learned how to be a very good defensive wrestler to keep it. Cause I, I think it's true when you look at him as a, as a fighter, he wasn't the biggest guy. He wasn't the fastest guy. The, the things that he could control, his conditioning, he was very, he's just like you. Oh, fantastic. He was a freaking machine when it came to his conditioning and his ability to keep that pace going. And you look at the volume that he put out. He wasn't a big puncher. I'm not going to say he had pillow hands. He, he could, he could pop, yeah. you know, but he wasn't that guy that was. He wasn't you know, known for it. Yeah, it wasn't the one that people were worried about his punching power, like a Dan Henderson with the right mm -hmm. hand or something like that. But, man, the volume that he could put on you, man, he could just hit you to the point where he just 
beat you yeah. down and you couldn't you know couldn't see the one big shot coming that that's the one that puts you away so he he in my opinion he's the kind of guy that god didn't give him all those things but he made the things that he was given he made them work by putting hard work into it and saying no one's going to outwork me and it, it worked for him I would agree. Uh, I didn't want to tell him this because I don't want to embarrass myself in front of him, but <laughs> it was pretty funny. <clears throat> so he's calling the fight the other night against uh, Tetsuer and uh, and Roy Ball. He's yeah. calling the fight. And, my, and he's up there doing the uh, the interview. And my daughter goes, Dad, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, I go, no. Uh, she's like, he has like the gray hair on the sides too, like you. I started laughing. Yes, he does. Great. So I used to wear the glasses, you know, and she would watch me on TV and she knows that it's not always live. And that sometimes I can be home and I can be on TV. And so it was just kind of funny. Oh, that's great. That was a funny story. Anyways, but yeah, definitely. I wanted to just give him a little extra love after the interview because I thought this was, um, we got a lot of the rawness out of him, you know, and understanding, you know, uh, his relationship with whether it's Rockle, whether it's Hendo, whether it's Dana, whether it's really his family, you know, and things that he's done before in the past, his future. Uh, on top of that, though, too, he to me, even though, sure, he led the way in the UK market to kind of get them, you know, for the UK or for the UFC to continue to keep going to the UK because he was having success. Um, he is somebody that I feel still never got the credit he deserved because he didn't have that one crunch power. He didn't have the knockout power. He was, but he was beating guys. He was doing it the hard way and he deserves to have a little bit more of that respect. Uh, you know, it's not easy to fight those kind of fights. I fought a lot of my, my career was that I had to do that is, you know, you may lose the first round, but guess what? The conditioning cardio, the way that I'm going to outthink you and the way I'm going to outwork you is going to come to fruition as round two and three hit. Yeah. And so I felt like he never got the credit he deserved, even though he was the champion, even though that he had a whole country behind him. A lot of people said, ah, you know, he was nothing. He's this. No, no, no. He was, he was something cause he did it the hard way. And that, that says a lot about him as a, he's person. a blue, blue collar worker. Blue collar if fighter. I, if you can't say anything positive about him, just remember this. He won a UFC world title with one fucking eye. Yeah, shut the much. fuck up. Thank you very much. You don't much. have anything else to say? Shut yeah, up. Shut up. That that's all because you can't tell me that he didn't do it. He didn't he did it the right way. He did it the hard way. The fucking hard way. Dudes have been in the sport forever. Couldn't win it with two eyes. Let's do one with one. You know, got you gotta pat him on the back, man. I think he's a fantastic fighter. And uh, you know, it's the first time I've really had a great conversation with him, you know, in this in this perspective in this avenue yeah but in this space but uh you know i think that it was great to catch up with him great to get to know him a little bit better and uh good man good on him great having him on hopefully we see him again sounds good to me